channel. So, there it is. And there it is. Thank you. Um, so the History of Diving Museum, for those of you who are on uh, online, we're located in the beautiful Florida Keys, and we're real excited. We've had a wonderful dive into art fantasy exhibit up for the last uh, three or four months. It was a great collaboration with the Art Guild of the Purple Isles, the community, um, the Florida Keys Council of the Arts, the Tourism Development Council, and, uh, and eight schools from from the upper keys down to Marathon who had things on display. So we're excited about that. Unfortunately, it closes tonight. So we have a month to uninstall and install our next featured exhibit, will, which will be all about sponge hunters, the um, Key West hookers, the Tarpon Springs hard hat divers and the Bahamian free divers and all about the sponges and its uses, the industry, as well as sponge restorations that we're doing um, around the area and around the world uh, in modern day, you know, currently. So I would like to introduce Linnea Wilson, who is our the museum curator. She's been with us for how many years now? More than five. More than five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, she's gonna be talking to us all about the sponge. So uh, for those of you that are online, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Julie is gonna be monitoring that for us and we'll do a Q&A at the end. And if any of you have questions, you can ask them also so during the presentation. So take it away, Linnea. All right, thank you. So we're gonna to start tonight off with this riddle behind me. And anyone wanna venture a guess? It's a sponge, good. You're so smart. You're, are, we're starting off with a win. I love a victory. Um, but unlike 18th century children, you maybe haven't spent a lot of time in your life thinking about sponges. So tonight we're gonna to do a wide overview of this an aquatic animal that has had a really surprising impact on human history and human culture. And it has shaped whole regions of Florida and really the world at large. If you've ever eaten really good Greek food in Western Florida or seen a Junkanoo performance here in the Florida Keys or tuned into the Olympics, there's a small part of a sponge that is responsible for all of those things and many other experiences like them. Um, Lisa's introduced me, but I'll give a brief cursor of who I am and about the museum. So my name is Linnea Wilson. I've been the curator here for going on five years, and I have been working with my collaborator, Josh, to build an exhibit all about the sea sponge. It's called Sponge Hunters, and it's all about the people who have sought after, hunted for, collected sponges, and all of the important uses that these animals have had throughout history. It's surprisingly fascinating, and tonight I'm going to do the best job I can to give you just a I teaser, I don't... because there's so much. Hey guys, please meet yourselves when you enter the chat. Um, all right, so tonight you're going to get a sweeping overview because I couldn't possibly tell you everything that's in this exhibit. So I'm just going to give you enough that you have no choice. You have to come back and see the museum exhibit for yourself, which like Lisa said, it opens March 18th, May 18th. So we'll start with the sponge itself. What we know as sea sponge, what you've probably seen as a natural sponge in your life, is actually the skeleton of an aquatic animal. It's attached to the ocean floor or the coral on the ocean floor, where it was also a habitat for tons of other natural creatures, things like mollusks and worms, and even stone crabs and lobsters. So this here is the dried skeleton. And it was when it was first plucked from the ocean floor, it would have been filled with a slimy glue-like substance called the gurry. And that is the living animal. One 1889 source spoke poetically and beautifully about the sea sponge, and it said it resembles heads of decayed cabbage, and it would have smelled a bit like that too. So once the sponge was removed from the ocean, it was brought onto the boat where it begins a long process of decaying, and a, a lot of that happened on the boat where spongers were living for weeks or months at a time. A uh, word that comes up a lot in this research is odiferous, because I think sometimes the word smelly, it's just not enough. 
so this sponge in my hand it is clearly decomposed right we're not smelling it in here you're definitely not smelling it from your screen and it's definitely been cleaned some but it hasn't been trimmed so you can see where it was attached to the ocean floor like i said and you can even see some seashells that are still embedded in the caverns of this animal so this is an important habitat that has all kinds of incredible gifts that it gives to the ocean and there are thousands of different types and i'm actually going to pass some of these types of books so people in the audience can get to experience these experience in your life. all right so there's thousands of species right we have base sponges we have pillar sponges and they come in every kind of water we have across the planet. We see them in polar waters. We see them in our shallow tropical Caribbean waters. There's even some lakes that have various species of sponges. But if you're a diver or snorkeler, some of the brightest colors you've seen might not have been corals at all, but actually sponges, which make up a lot of the beauty of the reef. All right, I'll pass this one too, actually. Yeah. I have a whole lot of sponges. Yeah. I'll be sure to try to show them to you guys. Um, one really cool thing about this exhibit is it's not just Josh and I who have put in a lot of work. We've partnered with multiple scientists doing totally different projects with sponges. We've partnered with other historians from Tarpon Springs. Uh, we even have a helmet maker who has a history, a personal history about um, his grandfather came in 1913 as a sponge diver. And He's actually going to be giving next month's Immerse Yourself. So it'll be tied to what I'm talking about, but a very different perspective. And I talked to him on the phone yesterday. He's actually bringing sheets of raw material, the metal that he uses to build the helmets. So it'll be a really interesting perspective we're going to get. But say so that as I continue to pass out all these sponges. All right, this mammoth is a yellow sponge. I'll talk more about the different species as we go along. Yellow. So tropical sponges, all sponges are incredible and do incredible things, but tropical sponges can remove over 90% of bacteria present in the water in their environment. And they can cycle up to 20,000 times their own volume worth of water in a 24 hour period. So here where sponges are plentiful, they can effectively clean the bacteria in the water surrounding the reef several times per day. Our first recorded history of sponge use goes all the way back 5,000 years ago to the Phoenicians and ancient Egyptians. They were the first to use sponges and record that use, though not necessarily the first ever to use them. And sponging was an important industry throughout the Mediterranean, especially ancient Greece. I mentioned the Olympic Games, so they actually included free divers who would have been searching for sponges. That's how that industry speaks to sport, right? And Plato and Aristotle are two philosophers who were uh, including sponges and sponge divers and furry divers in some of their research and the things that they were thinking about, though they were not the only ones to be writing about spongers, certainly. And early Greek history, uh, sponges were used for all the things we think they were, bathing and cleaning, but they also had some other fun uses. Uh, Roman soldiers were given sponges to use as drinking vessels. They were less breakable than clay. They were lighter than metal. So they were, that was their drinking vessel of choice was the sea sponge. And if you were a, sea, or a, a Sunday school attendee, you might even remember multiple instances of sea sponges in the Bible. Jesus is given a sponge soaked in, in vinegar when he's on the cross. All right. And this use of sponge is the thing that interests me the most. It's the hardest to wrap your head around. Less than a hundred years ago, we didn't have mass produced fabric. We didn't have synthetic sponges. We didn't have things that we would use for washing the car, washing our dishes, washing ourselves. We didn't have packing peanuts. We didn't have stuffing to stuff inside of comfy furniture. And for all of these purposes, and so very many more, we used a sponge. And so given how important that use is, it's wild to think that a sea sponge harvested by hand from one of very few places in the world would have been used. But a natural sponge is an incredible thing. So everyone here just got to have hands on and touch them. And they are durable and they're soft and they're absorbent. and you may not know this, but they're also non-toxic and they are naturally antibacterial. 
the sponge for early humans was an incredible resource. And for the people that harvested them and processed them, and in fact, most importantly, the people who sold them, there was definite money to be made in the sponge trade. And yes, that is a roll of toilet paper you're seeing. There was an ancient Roman invention called the tesorium, which translates loosely to sponge on a stick. So most of the sea sponges you've seen in your life probably looks a smaller version of this one, the picture you see in the top of this slide. And that's because it's a commercial sponge. So of the thousands of sponge species there are, which there are some funky shapes and things you've seen in pictures or in person here, there's only so many commercial sponges that are especially prized because they're so useful to humans. And some of, and there's only so many places. So I just realized you guys can't see my slides. All right, so here are some of the types of commercial sponges. And a lot of them are floating around the room in here. And you're gonna see a lot of photos of them throughout the presentation as well. The most prized is the wool, the sheep, the sheep wool sponge and holding it, I can see why. It's pretty uniform in shape. It's very plush and soft to the touch, but also it's sturdy. It's holding up on its own quite well. Very different from say the grass sponge, which I have over on this table over here. So outside of the Mediterranean, where do we find these sponges? All right. And the answer is where we are here in Southern Florida, well, as well as Western Florida, Tarpon Springs, and the Bahamian Archipelago. And you'll see here, so it's like essentially this region. And I should say, those are the three areas we're gonna focus on today. And those are the main focuses of our museum exhibit because they tell the three histories of these three places, tell a really interwoven story, a narrative that helps you really understand the importance of the sponge trade, the history and the legacy of it. And you'll see there are things that connect all throughout this. But certainly there was also sponges being harvested and traded in adjacent areas. Cuba, for one, had a large sponge trade and was definitely part of this story. Similarly, where we are here in the Middle Keys, there was definitely sponges and sponging happening, as well as Miami and a few other places in Florida. But today we're mainly gonna be talking, oh, I'm missing a slide, I apologize. We're gonna be talking about Key West, Florida. We're gonna be talking about the Bahamas and we're gonna be talking about Tarpon Springs. And there's three main methods that, was, that spongers used. The first was free diving, uh, the earliest method, and that's true for most of diving history, right? It requires no special equipment. In shallow waters, it's as effective, it's, very effective, and it has no startup cost. If you've ever really seen your monthly budget be affected by a purchase of some diving equipment, you can certainly understand the appeal of free diving, especially to earlier human history. Then in the middle, we have hooking. Hooking, I think, is the most interesting because it's very different from the rest of the methods. Um, it's done entirely out of the water. So we see them standing on the boat, whereas the other two images we have here they're in the water, right? So all hook boats are made up of pairs. On the front, you have the hooker who stands with this long hook. I have a shorter hook with me today. And in the back, we have a sculler and they are working in tandem all day, every day, months at a time, communicating by verbal cues, by taps on the boat. The hooker stands at the front and he either is standing and sight fishing, looking in the water, trying to find those sponges, or he's using what's called a sponge glass, or sometimes a look bucket, or a water glass. There's many, many names for a simple invention. I have a modern reproduction here. A more modern, not that modern. Um, but essentially what this invention was, was a bucket that had its base kicked out and replaced with a pane of glass. So in choppier waters, you could submerge the bucket into the water and you can see the ocean floor underneath. It was a very useful tool when you're trying to do a rather difficult job of extending a long pole like you see he has into the water, finding your sponge and pulling it back up. This is an arduous job 
and they're in the Bahamas and Florida Keys and other places in Florida. It's hot. There are mosquitoes. It's the 1800s. There's, there's no sunscreen. This is a brutal job. And if you've ever slept wrong and woken up and you're like out of commission for a week, imagine your whole job is to huddle over the edge of the boat trying to find these sponges. In addition, excuse me, um, actually an even better image, I think, if you're a boater and you've ever had to pull a really stuck anchor, I want you to think of the worst time you've ever had doing this and imagine that was the whole experience for every, every day in and out for months at a time. A less common method compared to the look bucket is actually um, some spongers in Key West in the mid 1800s would actually extract oil from nurse sharks and they would spread that oil over the surface of the water and they'd be able to see more efficiently underneath from it. A lot less common, but when I read that in the research, I thought this will go in the presentation most definitely. So the last method is probably the most intuitive for a presentation from the history of diving and that's hard hat diving. But unlike the other two, it requires a lot of equipment and not, in, not just equipment, it requires skilled divers, people with knowledge of how to dive, as well as tenders, people who take care of the divers who are on the surface in the boat, making sure the tender has air, or excuse me, making sure the diver has air and that they are prepared and have everything they need. So this is the most cost focused and also requires the most skill. So from here, actually, I do want to say, though, every different operation would have used every method at some point. So most, so they all would have started with free diving because that's how we first explore. And then they would have moved to hooking. And this was seen in all of these areas. But there were certain areas that were much more loyal to certain methods, especially Key West. They were very loyal to the method of hooking. And a lot of drama happens because of the clashes of the different areas and the different methods. But we will get to the high drama, high sponge drama on the high seas later on. First, we're gonna do a little specific focus into our different areas. So the story of the sponge trade really does begin in the Bahamas in the Western hemisphere. Locals were using sponges that had washed up on shore, but there was no industry for this catch until 1840, when a Frenchman is wrecked on the shores of the islands and finds that local people have this abundance of sponges. So he, in 1841, brings 500 to 600 specimens back with him to France, where he finds he's very easily able to sell these high quality sponges. So he quickly organizes additional shipments to come and quickly an industry is established and the Bahamas dominates this industry for nearly a hundred years. Though touch and go with Key West who they also kind of share resources with to some extent. So the main fishing ground you see here and it's called the big the mud and it's west of Andros, but there's sponging really done throughout this area. Oh, forgive me, the, I didn't expect how difficult it would be to talk to both audiences. I appreciate your patience tonight as we figure out how to re-enter this lecture You're doing program. A great job. Thank you. You're doing a great job. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Renoir. The Frenchman was named Gustave Renoir and he gets this industry going. But eventually it encompasses not just the Bahamas. We see Florida, Jamaica, Honduras, Nicaragua, many other Caribbean nations all contributing to this industry and also Florida as well. Florida, Bahamas and Cuba remain biggest producers in this region in the 1800s. At the height of the sponge trade, most schooners in the Bahamas were built specifically for sponging. A typical vessel was about 50 feet in length with eight to 10 man dinghies stacked on the deck. So these are large boats that are having multiple smaller boats on top of them. And a fun fact, these hook boats always had an odd number of people because 
Remember our hookers are in pairs. We have a hooker and a scholar on the hook boat but there was always one cook on these vessels. And he had every job under the sun, making sure people eat, but then trimming sponges, making sure things were processed, making everyone had the things they needed. It was a real labor to be the, the one man. One artifact I'm really excited about that we're including in this exhibit is actually a passport of a Greek diver, excuse me, not a diver, a Greek cook who came over in order to be part of the sponge industry in the 1900s. All right, so back to the Bahamas though, our main focus right now. So the muds are west of Andros and sponging is prominent throughout the Bahamas, but the process is not the same. And you're gonna see how it's different in Key West. Prior to 1939, these sponge grounds were the most productive in the world. Um, hookers went out in dinghies, they filled them up with sponges, returned to the main vessel, or they are processing them. They dry them out. The animal matter begins to decompose. The fishermen then make for shore. And there they dig what's called a crawl. And that is an interesting thing. Crawl does not sound like an English word. And you see it's spelled K-R-A-A-L. And I actually have a picture of one right here on the left. You see how these sticks are pressed into the water. So that is like a corral that the sponges would go in those and the tides would wash the decomposing matter out of them, and it would help speed up the process of their decomposition and the processing. But I point out that it is not an English word. In fact, it is a word much more common in places like Southern Africa. That's a spoiler. You'll, you'll learn more about that later, I promise. And then the next step is the spongers beat their sponges with sticks to hurry, removing the gurry, that animal matter from the sponge. And then much more painstakingly remove any kind of debris and coral and rock from them in order to ensure that they are in a nicer presentable matter before they're brought back to Nassau to the markets. And they are bringing massive amounts of sponges. We're talking 5,000 to 15,000 sponges from one month voyage on one of these larger sponger vessels. And there's when things start to be a little different. At this point, we've seen spongers doing intensely difficult work. It's grueling, it's hot, there are mosquitoes, but are they getting an equal amount of the pie? And before I change the slide, I do want you to check out these spongers in the boat here. We have our scholar and he's clearly navigating. And then we have a much more historically accurate picture of a look bucket. So our, our hooker is in the front with his very long hook and he's checking out sponges underneath. Okay, so our sponges are processed and they're ready to be exported. Buyers are, include people, or excuse me, buyers include Nassau merchants, but predominantly European merchants. And they represented much larger foreign sponge markets. Because remember, we, the history in the Mediterranean goes back 5,000 years. So there is definitely a framework for these sponges to enter into this market. And this system created immense wealth for the people who are selling the sponges. But the people who were doing the actual labor were largely people who had been enslaved. And this is a really important dynamic to understand that we cover much more in depth in the exhibit. But the short version is that the Bahamian Islands were used to intercept ships carrying enslaved people when the British slave trade was abolished in 1807. Nearly 7,000 Africans were free in this effort and they were settled without choice in the Bahamas. By 1834, slavery was abolished throughout the British empire, which included the Bahamas at that time. And in 1865, it was abolished in the US. I tell you all this because you need to have this framework in mind to understand the Bahamian sponger lived in virtual poverty with very little opportunity for upward movement or for literal movement changing the situation that they were in. Instead of wages, spongers got shares of the profit, but they were forced to borrow against those profits before going out on these expeditions. And so this created a vicious cycle of death, sort of like sharecropping, if you learned about this, but a more exploitative version. By 1917, though, the Bahamian sponging industry was flourishing. Europe was now three years into World War I, which means that the Mediterranean sponge trade those laborers were busy doing other things. Their production was halted as they were focused on a war. You'll see this is a recurring theme of this era. 
about 27% of all the sponges harvested in 1917 came from the Bahamas. And the industry employed about 6,000 men and women, which was about a third of the population of the Bahamas at the time. Then the start of World War II happens, and it requires more sponges than ever for cleaning and manufacturing tanks and other weapons. But unfortunately, in 1938, the Bahamas first start to notice a fungal bloom, what's called a blight in the sponge writings of the time. And by 1939, the Bahamian industry is done. The sponge blight has wiped out their, their commercial sponge beds and their non-commercial sponges as well, and their habitat is grossly changed. Well, the war effort can't exactly wait for those sponge beds to recover, and so the synthetic sponge is invented. Smoke because when needs arise, they have to be filled. This marks a period of intense economic devastation in the Bahamas and throughout the world. 1939 was not a good year for most nations. The Allies couldn't wait, and one response from this sponge die-off was a huge influx in immigration to the United States, especially Miami, Key West, and Central Florida. So this is a very sad end, but I will give you a spoiler and tell you one really cool thing about sponges is they regenerate. You can cut off a section of a sponge and you can regrow it underwater. And the Bahamian sponge beds do come back, though it takes many years, and there's still intense efforts in the Bahamas, as well as in our waters and many waters throughout the world to reno renovate, regenerate the sponge community. And for locals and for people traveling through the Florida Keys, one of the scientists that we are working with who's helped curate sections of this exhibit is actually working with eye care, a local group to lead sponge dives. So you'll learn about the sponge as an organism, you'll get to help cut up samples of sponges, and then you'll get to outplant them onto our reefs, which help improve reef quality. We talked about what an incredible filter sponges are and what a beautiful element they add to the reef. So if you're interested in diving in a really cool way, definitely keep an eye on our newsletter and our website to see what fun things we have happening. But from here, like so many Bahamian conchs, we are moving to Key West. I use that term specifically. Um, anyone who's local to the Keys in the 21st century would tell you Key West conch means someone who was born in the Keys, especially to someone, to parents who were also built, born in the Keys. This conch is a term reserved for true locals. And they have many incredible traditions, which I am not trying to take away from at all. But in the 1800s, that term actually referred to Bahamians in Key West. All right, so the settling of Key West is an interesting story. It's a wild, wild place in the early 1800s. It's officially in Spanish hands, but it's filled with pirates and wreckers. And in 1822, it becomes a US territory. Well, the residents quickly want to establish their seaport as an important part of the United States of this young nation. And the way that they want to do that is by showing what valuable commodities they have that they can offer to the mainland. The biggest parts of these industries are wrecking. Wrecking is a practice that we call marine salvage today, and it's highly controlled. But at the time, it was a much more wild place, as I said. So essentially, wreckers would watch the Florida reef line for shipwrecks, and then they would rescue those boats and rescue, most importantly, their cargo. And they would sell that cargo either on the open market or back to those original sailors. This is an important industry that helped build the city of Key West. In fact, by 1860s, Key West was the wealthiest city in America because of the practice of wrecking, as well as several other marine trades, including turtling, so catching sea turtles, uh, fishing in general, though this was very difficult before the era of refrigeration, and lastly, of course, sponging. By 18, oh, here I have two quotes from the 1855. So Key West established 1822, and by 1855, these two quotes are appearing in the New York Times. So this helps illustrate how well they established themselves. Everything is coral here, or rather everything is 
based on coral. The keys, the sponges, the harbors, the reefs, and the wrecking business. So the second quote is my favorite. The wreckers are bred to the sea. What they don't know about fishing, turtling, and egging isn't worth knowing. Mm -hmm. Again, these were published in the New York Times in 1855. Do you have a question? Um, about the sponges, the, the gurry is the animal size. Exactly. So when you hold the sponge, this here is the skeleton. The question, if you didn't hear it, was about the gurry. What is the gurry? So this is just the skeleton. The actual animal is the, all of the sea sponge, the natural sponge, but the gurry is the part that makes it. And uh, how long does it usually take to dry out? Most of the process I read about, and they did change a little bit from Bahamas to Key West to Sharpen Springs. Um, most of them, it's about a two week process, I would say. And the last part of it, uh, I don't think I mentioned this, is bleaching. So if you've seen a sea sponge, usually they're a more golden honey color, whereas these are a much darker brown. And when they first come out of the water, they range in colors, but like a wool sponge in particular would be a dark, almost black gray. So a little less beautiful than what you might buy at Target. All right, so 1840s, sponges are becoming a huge industry in Key West and wrecking is, we've talked about, vital, right? But we have new maps being made and we have technology like lighthouses being introduced. So wrecking is becoming still prominent, still building intense wealth, but it's becoming less prominent as there are fewer shipwrecks happening. Overall, for human history, this is a good thing. We would like less shipwrecks, uh, but at the time, this would have been a difficulty that pushed a lot of wreckers into other maritime industries or other industries important to Key West, like cigar rolling and cigar making. But we see a huge boon in sponging in this era, which also makes sense because this is when the Bahamas are setting up their industry as well. All right, the Civil War then intensifies this because now we have cargo ships that are less comfortable coming through Key West waters. And so the sponge trade becomes a much more important element of Key West's establishment. I want to elaborate on the techniques for hooking too much in Key West because they're so similar to the Bahamas, in part because a lot of the hookers in Key West at this time are Bahamians themselves. They're people that migrated in search of better opportunities. But as early as 1860, we start to see indications that the sponge beds in Key West are becoming depleted. Uh, they turn to deeper waters, they venture out further and further, but even this is not enough. By the 1880s, they're reporting a decline, not just in the number of sponges being collected, but the quality as well. Even when they're venturing into water as deep as 40 or 50 feet, which when we think about process of hooking, how long that hook is, the deeper water you are, the more you're affected by currents, the more just strength it takes to pull sponges out of the water. By comparison, early sponges in Key West, they were in water about 10 to 15 feet. So they're har harvesting about half of what they had only a decade before, and Key West begins to pressure the Florida legislature to do something about this problem, to establish limits and to protect Florida resources. This is important because it is an ongoing tactic that Key West will continue to seek out. They also begin to move far outside of their waters, further from Florida Bay than they have ever gone. And in 1870, a sponge bed is discovered in the Gulf of Mexico on Florida's west coast near Tarpon Springs. So we'll pause on Key West here, and we're going to travel to the homesteads and the newly developing cities near these sponge beds. So I've just used the word discover and new, and these are not ideal terms here. Because what's recorded, this is historically accurate in terms of what Key West is recording, but realistically there was people that lived here that had been sponging in these waters for three decades. But Key West is a pretty powerful city and they have a powerful sponge market, the only one in this region. Um, that's not true, sorry, along with the Bahamas, but the only one in this country. And that's important. So as spongers are moving more, Key West spongers are moving more and more into Tarpon Springs, Tarpon Springs spongers who are doing this to subside, to take care of their families, 
they start to become frustrated. We have Tarpon Springs hookers working these beds and suddenly a group with much more power is building crawls on their shores, is taking their resources from their sponge beds. And this is the beginning of a lot of friction. But this is also difficult for Key West. This is a long way to travel. Key West is about right here. And this is Tampa. And just for context, we have the Bahamian Islands over here. So they're traveling a long way in the mid to late 1800s in order to take quite a large amount of creatures and having to process them and store them and then go all the way back to the markets they've established in Key West. By 1887, Tarpon Springs has established a market themselves. It's still very small. It produces only 5% 5 of the sponges that come out of Florida in that year. And Key West is certainly continuing to dominate this industry, but it's clear the tides are changing. So added to this, we have the theme of war again. The Spanish vessels during the Spanish-American War, they drive Key West boats even further away from their original waters, and they force fishermen to have to land their catch in Tarpon Springs in a more aggressive way. And soon, Tarpon Springs is considerably more frustrated, and this settlement starts to become a real rival to Key West. So we have two Florida regions using the same method, hooking, to go after the same resource in the same waters. And that's when things get very, very juicy. By 1890, Turpin Springs has become a significant sponge market. And this growth attracts settlers. This is important. It especially includes Greek men, Greek divers from the Mediterranean sponge diving industry. And they were motivated by the prospect of new sponge beds after a blight in the Mediterranean had affected their industry. So with them, they bring knowledge as well as a different method of sponging altogether, and that's hard hat diving. So on June 18th, 1905, a diver is lowered overboard with a hook very much like this one. The shorter hooks like these would have been used by divers. I want you to think, we talked about how arduous the process of hooking from a boat is. So imagine you're walking along the seafloor, scooping sponges up and putting them in your bag. And after an hour a dive, you come up with significantly more sponges than a hooker would have gotten in that time period. For the Key West hookers, this is a lose-lose situation. They are the furthest from home they've ever been forced to go. And Tarpon Springs spongers now have a much easier method of collecting sponges, of selling them, and of exporting them. This, yeah, absolutely. What made them go to Tarpon Springs instead of going to Key West? So the Key West sponge beds started to show de like signs of depletion in the 1860s. And they were quickly able to get half as many sponges, half as high a quality um, as they had in previous decades. So they had to go further out to find better sponges and they ended up in other people's waters. And they weren't available in the Bahamas either. Well, they, no, because in... Sorry. That's a... Sorry, don't... <laughs> that's a harder question to answer. So there, it may not look it on a map, but that's a much harder navigational pass to the Bahamas than it would have been to Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Um, so, okay, right. So back to Tarpon Springs. They're having great success as divers, but they have almost too much success because in the first month of diving for sponges in Tarpon Springs, they crash the market. They have such a wealth of sponges that the supply expands rapidly and sponges that were worth eight to $10 in the opening weeks of 1906, we're now selling for $3 by May. And this intensive fishing lowers prices overall. It increases the competition and it simulates even more intensive fishing. The Greek spongers revolutionized this industry with diving equipment. And by the first decade of the 20th century, they outnumbered the traditional Key West spongers. The and I do wanna draw attention to this postcard because it's a great historical image. You have the American flag clearly on the back, but in the center of that image is you have the Greek flag because it is a true mixing and I think this is a great representation here. But at this point, the commercial center of the American sponge trade moves from Key West to the Gulf Coast. And 
And this remains true even when sponges are no longer the prime catch. This cutthroat competition, together with a declining yield, excuse me, from the overworked sponge banks, quickly forces many boat-based spongers out of the industry. So between 1900 and 1918, the number of men in the Key West sponging industry declined by more than 50%. This led to immense conflicts between these two groups of fishermen, and it truly characterizes this era of sponge history. Key Westers lobby again, but this time they want to make diving gear illegal on sponge boats, and they succeed, but it is poorly enforced. And it goes back and forth like, forth like this. Boats are set on fire, perpetrators are caught, but laws are not enforced. Um, sponges have to hire guards to guard their crawls so that sponges aren't stolen. But this heightened fighting eventually dissipates. It disappears much like the sponges in Key West sponge beds. And this feels so drastic for me as a researcher, but the reality is that in this time period, just like the, many of these spongers had been wreckers, they would have moved to other maritime industries. And even when they were sponging as their prime focus, on days of bad weather or bad situations, they might've also adjusted their plans in order to fish or to turtle or to do other things on those days. Because these are people who were living to survive by the sea. But by this point, they were also looking at other industries like manufacturing jobs because these things were increasing in volume and they certainly would have appealed to exhausted fishermen. So in some regards, this makes Tarpon Springs the clear victor of this rivalry, right? But the reality is that the world was quickly changing. The health of the commercial sponge beds was already critically depressed in Key West. And then in 1938, we saw that fungal blight take out Bahamian beds. And a year later, it hits Tarpon Springs. Mm -hmm. I mentioned in our Bahamian focus that World War II had intense need for sponges, right? If they couldn't be providing much needed sponges, then the spongers, as well as the men and, the women, and women trimming the sponges and processing them, all of the labor that happened on land, if they weren't providing sponges, they had to provide other things for the war effort to include people or other manufacturing jobs. World War II also led to increased innovation out of sheer need, much like we talked about the industrial, or excuse me, the uh, synthetic sponge being then invented when sea sponges were less able to be procured. Well, in that, if we look at the slide again, more than half of what you see here was invented in the 1940s. And that's very likely not a coincidence, right? Human ingenuity had us use a sponge for all of these purposes and many more, and that made the sponge invaluable, creating the need for this entire history that you just absorbed. And then over a hundred years, human invention lessened our need for these aquatic animals. So you've now seen a wide spray of history through the porous lens of the sponge. And it's so interesting to look at history in this way. It can be very eye-opening to think about history through a very, very specific focus. And there is no better place to do them, that than at the History of Diving Museum. Diving truly impacts so many aspects of our lives, whether you're in the Florida Keys like I am or in landlocked Kansas. So if you'd like to learn even more about the sponge industry or dive into a whole different historical focus, be sure to check out our new exhibit, which opens May 18th. And I promise there is so much more to this story. Thank you for your attention. I'd love to have any questions. I have a question. A lot of times in um, the fishing industry and different things, they learn what something productive that they can do with their byproduct. Were they ever able to use something for this, the, that glue or the, the oh, inside that's a, of the bean? <laughs> that's a very interesting question. So it's, was there any productive use of the gurry, the liquid that was coming out of skeleton? Sort of. Um, so actually there are a lot of things I read in the research about divers, especially, or um, spongers on boats using the still wet half rotting animal to clean the windows of um, like the windows of helmets because it's naturally acidic or even like for cleaning on 
doing dishes, which makes sense. They didn't probably even have ease by transport. So they were bringing with them. Um, sounds like we've got some unmuted unmuted people in the chat, which I think if you want to ask your question live, that's probably fine. We'll see if we can pull this yeah. up. Um, which is the most popular sponge, the one you were showing us? Oh, that's a great, which is the most popular sponge? Mm -hmm. So in our region, certainly the wool sponge was the most prized. You did, I did read a lot also about the velvet sponge, which seems like it was a bit of a rarer one. I'm gonna grab another sponge mm -hmm. to compare. Actually, So the yellow sponge, this one here, was also commonly found in our waters. And when I talked about how they were finding less quality sponges, it might have been that they were finding more yellow sponges than they were wool. So you guys can't feel this to experience it. I'm sorry. This is very soft, very pliable, useful for so many purposes. This one, this is a loaf. It is so hard and much sturdier. And certainly it was referenced a lot using it for washing carriages, um, but not as multi purpose. And then by contrast, we have a sponge like this hardhead sponge, which is incredible to look at and just the way that it is. It looks like a coral. It's it looks like a coral, absolutely. Um, but if you were trying to wash your carriage or yourself or your dishes, <laughs> this is probably not gonna be the first thing that you choose. Uh, so, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that sponges are naturally antibacterial. Uh, I don't know if you can elaborate on that. Um, not much more than to say sponges are naturally antibacterial. Um, luckily, I don't have to have all the answers to the question. I have to make sure I have the people who do involved in the project. Even with the, even with the gurry, it's still oh, no, anyway. once, it, uh, once it's dried out. I think once it's dried out, but it may have been with the gurry to some extent as well, because it was used for cleaning purposes. Mm. Julia has some uh, questions in the chat, so I think she'll uh, reach out and ask you those. All right. So I'm not sure if Julia is going to appear. Julia is our she's newest coworker here. Herself, and she's going to read the questions. All right. And if you continue to have questions and you're on our live stream, feel free to enter them into the chat and we will try to catch all of them. OK, um, so our first question is from Liz. Currently, are okay. there rules about taking sponges from the waters in the Keys? Are they protected? I do not know the answer to the question, but I do know that our sponge environment here is not in the best shape. And there are a lot of programs like the dives I mentioned that are looking to improve the situation of our reefs. There's a long res restoration project with multiple Florida universities, other institutions. And I'll interject that um, there, you're not supposed to take anything, any of the resources without permitting. So you that way people can't harvest um, and that's how they control the restoration efforts. All right, this is, if in case you didn't hear that, our director just piped in, you shouldn't take anything without a permit. Yeah. Take only pictures, leave only memories, I yeah. think, right? Um, I do see one question here, which I'm pretty sure came from my parents and it is, what about, <laughs> what about loofahs? Which is a fun question. Loofahs, what we you probably have seen before, totally a lie. Um, Luthas are not a sponge at all. They are actually a vining plant. And when you see them growing, they look very much like a cucumber. Um, if you go to the Fairchild Gardens on your way towards Miami, they actually have several growing there. It's pretty wild to see. They're actually edible. They eat them in all kinds of parts of Southeast Asia. Yeah, not a sea sponge at all. Okay. I have another question here from Sally. What is the cost of natural sponges today? So I've looked at this extensively for our gift shop here at the museum. They're about $8 for a small wool sponge. <laughs> um, and our last question is from Humberto. Have the tarpon sponge beds recuperated? Yes, the, um, the tarpon sponge beds, I don't think that there's a lot of active fisheries happening, but they do still dive for like tourists or to have a unique experience. And I think that their sponges are in a better position but I imagine there's also restoration efforts happening there. Okay. From David, how does the sponge population today compare to the density at the peak of the sponge industry? That's hard for me to compare, but I imagine not great. Uh, our, I know that our sponge 
climate here in the Keys is not in a great position, and there are those active restoration efforts happening. Okay. And the last one is from Alan. He asks, are there any photos that you have of sponges in their natural habitat? I do. I have one this presentation. Bear, bear with me as you see my forehead very close up. <laughs> You can minimize that. Oh, there we go. All right. So here, and this is actually, these are the same species of sponge. This is a wool sponge you're seeing. Bottom right is, of course, in its natural environment. And the top left is after being fully processed and bleached. And those are two very different looking sponges, certainly. Can you talk about the difference between the base type sponges and the commercial sponges that they use? Sure, so commercial sponges were prized for their uniformity as well as several other features. Whereas a vase sponge, which I think I have one over here, is actually, so this is a, a grass sponge, it's not technically a vase sponge, but it's gonna give you a better idea of what these would look like underwater. So vase sponges can be really large, can be really hollow on the inside, and certainly if you're using them for human use, commercial use, they're not gonna be helpful to you as something like a massive yellow sponge that you could cut up to make multiple things you're gonna sell. They're, they're, they're that dark, like you said, they're very, before they're harvested, they're black like that at the bottom one? I think I may have gotten kicked off the presentation. Mm. Um, and it's not giving me the opportunity to start. I'm gonna grab Julia's laptop. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> How is that? Do you see Linnea? Linnea Bob. I assume if you can still see me. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming and for your great questions. Uh -huh. So try to go back in just in case maybe it's minimized. Oh, there we are. Yeah. And then just expand out. All right. I see. Oh, I see a message from Elena. It's good to see you as well. All right. What about Lufas? I think this is the bulk of our questions, although it seems like some other people are putting in comments and things as well in here. Will there be examples of an authentic Tarpon Springs made helmet in the new exhibit? Yes, we actually have several in our permanent collection, which the coolest thing is seeing how they compare to Greek helmets, um, but we will have several on display in this exhibit. And like I said, next month's Immerse Yourself will be a helmet maker from Tarpon Springs who's gonna have so many cool things to talk about with us. All right, so I think Lisa's gonna make some closing statements, but thank you all for your patience as you were with us for our first hybrid Immerse Yourself. It was so so good to have people in the room with us, but we're gonna be figuring some things out over the next few presentations. So Lisa. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, so as Lene had mentioned, we've got a lot of things that are gonna be happening in with sponges for the next through the end of the year from may through the end of the year um sign up for our websites we're going to do we have some special weekend presentations we're going to be doing some snorkel restorations some scuba diving restorations we're going to do some sponge id so we can go out there and see a lot of the sponges that are out there when even though they were used for commercial use um, and as divers they had different properties so if you're a diver and sometimes you accidentally bump up against one, they had um, different enzymes that would actually burn, kind of like fire coral. So um, even though there's a lot out there about the commercial diving industry as divers, we also need to be careful about what's in our underwater environment. So a lot of that will be um, in the exhibit, as well as learning about some of the uh, medical research that's being done um, by one of the researchers that's going to be helping us, Shirley um, Pompani. 
who's going to be helping us and expanding more on the antibacterial and the um, cancer research and things like that, that they're doing. So um, tune in. Again, you can watch this on our YouTube station. Put in the little chat where you're watching from and how many people um, are with you. And um, I think that's uh, what we've got for tonight. So thank you very much. We say don't drive by, dive in. Next time you're in the beautiful Florida Keys. And thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank <laughs> you.